wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome. It's time for a brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, as always, your TV Guidance Counselor, here to talk about classic television using back issues of TV Guide magazine from my personal collection as the gateway into our collective past. And this week's episode is so much fun for me. My guest is one of my favorite actors and writers, Frank Whaley. I, uh, I called him Wally at the beginning because I can't pronounce names, uh, but sorry, we, we discuss it here. Anyway, Frank is incredibly, incredibly talented, really funny guy. Uh, I had a great time talking to him, and you will really enjoy me talking to him. He's got amazing stories. This run of episodes that I've had the last couple weeks and going uh, forward is is just really fun for me. Got to talk to some of some great actors with some great stories and people who I've wanted to talk to for years that either were inaccessible physically because of not being in the same city or state as them. So there is some, I don't know if it's good stuff. There's, there's some silver lining to the lockdown maybe, uh, but uh, for me at least, and, and hopefully for you, because you get to hear it. You probably know Frank from everything. He's been in so many good things. Uh, a ton of all of our show movies. He was in The Doors, Career Opportunities, which I talk about on the show often. Uh, Buddy Farrow with Dennis Farino, which we talk about here, and, and a bunch of other stuff. He also has a daily uh, Whaley Family podcast, and I'll put up links to that. Uh, that is very fun and interesting, and you will enjoy that. So I, I highly recommend you check that out as well. Uh, anyway, this is a great episode. You'll like it. I like it. I think Frank liked it. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Frank Whaley. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time with me. Frank Wally, how are you, sir? Good, good. You can you can say Wally, but it's actually Whaley. Oh, it's Whaley. Oh, yeah. See, I slaughter names like a gym teacher. A lot, a lot, I get that a lot for some reason when I'm in Canada. People oh. pronounce it that way. Canadians. See, I'm a Boston guy, and we mispronounce everything. We slaughter the language. Right. Well, I'm from upstate New York, so our, our language is very similar. Our, our dialect is very similar. That's true. Also, and this is a good segue into something I'd be remiss if I didn't mention before we get into the guy, but I think maybe your first on-screen job was up here in a Spencer for Hire. Very good. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was my first, my first role um, on, on screen. I played, I think the character was called evicted boy oh yes the classic evicted boy essay That's my character yeah <laughs> I, I actually tried and when i got I, m- I remember i think i took the train from new york and when i got there on set i asked horrible question to ask and i asked complete if i was going to ask a question i was asking the wrong person <laughs> I went up to like the first assistant director who has no authority whatsoever in terms of like creative things and said would it be okay if they gave my character a name <laughs> And he looked at me quizzically and I said, and, he, and I said, yeah, like you could have like her, my mom, who was like mother of evicted boy, <laughs> say, say, for instance, say Brian, like I was trying to rewrite it. So I would right. have a name. So in the credits, when it rolled, I would, would have a name and not evicted boy. But <laughs> the writer was on set and was like, no, his name is evicted boy. That's I'm his sure actual writer, name. <laughs> I'm sure if the writer got wind of this young person trying to make suggestions he would he would have said get rid of him get him out of here <laughs> he's evicted he has two lines <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah now he's the literal evicted boy for evicting him. <laughs> were you doing a lot of theater at the time because i know that show pulled a lot from new york theater actors a ton of people show up in those three seasons no i was i was do- i was doing very fringe off 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 broadway theater i mean i was really i was i think about like 23 but i was i was so young looking i was playing I had an advantage that I could, I was in my mid twenties, early to mid twenties, but I could play like young teenagers. In fact, my first film role, I played like 13. I was, I was a college graduate. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was playing like a 14 year old kid. And that was an advantage because they didn't have to, you know, if a character is that young, then they don't have to pay for like, you know, a guardian or school or anything like that. Like that. And I, I happened to at the time look very, very young for my age. And um, in fact, I lied. My first agent 
I lied to them. <laughs> I was 24 and I told them I was 16 because they were a children's agency. Right. So I, I went in and in those days you could go in and audition for an agent. I don't think they do. I'm sure they don't do that anymore. But I went in, it was a Saturday morning and I went into this company. It was called J. Michael Bloom Agency and they represented mostly children. They had two, two divisions, an adult division, but they all had children's division and i went in and, and uh, i said i was 16 you know when i auditioned and they said can you can you can you send your mom up because after I, I did a monologue and they decided you know that was great we would love to represent you i said fantastic they said oh well, well is your mom out there in the waiting room and i said oh no 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 she's out in the car in fact my mother was like 700 miles away she's probably in a cocktail bar uh, at the time she might have been in a car she probably was yes Doing a job. Yes. Now I'm not, I'm implying my mother's a prostitute and I, I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's but, um, <laughs> We've yeah, all done it. Yes. Uh, and then they said, well, can you, can you go out and bring her up? And I said, no, she, uh, I said, she can't leave. She can't turn the car off because the transmission's broken. <laughs> this is quick on and, your feet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they, they had no, they had no answer for that. So they said, all right, fine. Just not. <laughs> she's manually holding the transmission <laughs> together with her hands. <laughs> she's got a, she's got a screwdriver in the yeah. ignition, which is, which is keeping the car alive. It's not so much our car, if you want to be. Right. Yeah. I, yes. I picture when we hot wired it, we didn't expect to turn it off and then turn it back on. Right. We got to get home. And if we turn it off, we're not going to get there. Imagine you'd be like, let me just go get her. But she's very insecure about her appearance. So she won't come in, but she'll talk to you through the door. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello. You, you can sign my son. <laughs> it's okay. Did well, you hear she said it's fine. She wrote a note. Were they sending you out on a lot of commercial ads and stuff that you would send a kid out on? Because they thought that's what I, that's all I was, at the time. That's all I was doing, and you know, and, the, uh, and I was doing. I did the way I was able to get out from under all these weight. I was waiting tables. I was doing all these guys crazy. You know, like sell. I was selling tube socks on the street on a card table off some guy. Some some guy was getting, gave me these. I went to this place in Queens, got these tube socks. And sold them, and and I split the money with this guy. I don't, I don't, I have no idea why I thought that was a good idea. But and I was working for a catering company as a waiter. I was working two or three jobs, waiting tables, and I got a commercial for a, a product called Stuff It, Stuff It, Stack It. Uh, and, and I don't even remember what it was called. But it was for lockers. Okay. For kids' lockers, you could leave like a message. It was like an early answering machine oh, for, yes. for a locker. Yeah. Uh, Stuff and Stack and Express It, I think it was named the product. I got I got that commercial and it, and it ran in movie theaters, it ran on television, it ran everywhere. And suddenly I was getting residual checks for five thousand dollars in, in my mail in my mailbox. And it was I, I mean, I came from nothing. Like yeah. my family was dirt poor. I had no money. I was barely scraping by. And suddenly, I mean, it was a, it was like a miracle. I had all, I I could quit my job, and but that le- that commercial led to a pizza commercial and a, like a Montgomery Ward thing, and and I did a whole whole bunch of commercials, and that's and and then slowly I started getting like Spencer for Hire type things. Yeah. Um, I did, I did that one. I did the equalizer. I did yes. uh, a couple of after school specials, I think. Did after school specials. Uh, you know, I, basically, I did anything. I, I was taking any job I could. And anything they offered me, I took, which probably not the best idea. I don't know. You're always a delight when you show up in these things, even if it is just playing evicted boy. But right. if you look, it was only, what, three years between Spencer for Hire and then you're in a movie with Brando? Is that right? Yeah. yeah it was 80, 87 yeah, and 90, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it happened pretty fast, and and I was again, I, I, I you know, I, I, my only regret is if I had, could do it over again, I probably would have said no to something like like after well, after I did my first film, which was Iron League with Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, yeah. like that was a big deal. Everybody wanted it was a, it was a it was a small supporting role, but everybody wanted that role. All all the actors my age uh, wanted that role, and I was able to get that role because I was playing Nicholson in Flashback as a young as a young kid and. So instead of like resting on that and letting, you know, with a good agent or manager, like, you know, pursuing equal things, I'm like, you know, Hallmark, uh, Hallmark card ad. Sure. I'll do that. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, after school, I think I did it like after I did Iron Week, I did an after school special, which, <laughs> you know, like you don't even really need that. You no. know, but, 
but being you know coming from meager beginnings you're kind of afraid to say no to anything and uh but yeah it was and then and then you know um, up up the ladder to you know better things field of dreams and and uh the freshman yeah you know, like i that mean kind of that's what a huge difference. I mean, not that the, the caliber of people in those other things was, was pretty good still. I mean, you know, like Robert Eric and those people were no one to, you know, shake a stick at, but you know, <laughs> feel the dreams, uh, you know, yeah. Brando, a couple of years later, like that's insane. And were you intimidated or was it a kind of the situation where you were sort of so new at it or so young that you, you, you didn't know enough to be intimidated? Oh, I didn't know enough. I wasn't, I mean, I was a little bit intimidated by Burt Lancaster and, 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 but Brando was, you know, really great. He was a nice guy. Um, I mean, he was nice to me. He was nice to everybody, but he was nice to me. And he, um, the funny thing is like, like I said, all I wanted to do was make money, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and, you know, because of my background, I didn't really understand the importance of the big picture. I was just looking at, you know, the, the immediate gratification and like I, I, I was cast in a movie called little monsters. Oh yeah. You played boy. <laughs> I played boy. And at the same time I was doing born on the 4th of July. So I was doing a movie with Howie Mandel yep. and um, an Oliver Stone movie with Tom Cruise. And, and one was the little monsters thing was really getting in touch, getting in, getting, putting in peril my born on the 4th of July role because was overlapping. I was trying to, you know, I was flying back and forth and I, you know, it was, it was, I should, I shouldn't have been doing the little monsters. Right. I should have been focusing on the board of the 4th of July, but I wanted to do both. And, you know, in retrospect, I'm happy I did because I have, have all that stuff to look back on, but probably bad representation. Like I should have had somebody say, Frank, let's avoid Howie Mandel. We'll yeah. all do respect to Howie Mandel. And let's go <laughs> on like, this is Tom Cruise and, yeah. and I'll talk. So. Yeah. Frank, someone drinks piss in this movie. Uh, you wanna, <laughs> obviously not talking about 4th of July, um, <laughs> but you're great in that. I mean, that boy character is terrifying and like Rick Duke, yeah, was fun, fun, but, it was fun. um, so it's, so it's not like you show up in movies where I'm like, oh, what's he slumming in this? Like you always up the, up the caliber of the, the flick you're in or whatever you're in, which is kind of great. I appreciate it. Thanks. But it totally makes sense. You know, having also come from Northeast meager beginnings myself, it's, and doing stand up and that stuff, you do feel bad turning anything down because if, until you really get established, you feel like I'm lucky to get any of this. So who am I to say no? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, these days, you know, it's, you're, you're better off. If I were to do it all over again, I would have been much more careful with things. But then again, you know, everything falls into place. No regrets. You know, all that stuff is some, you know, the stuff that does, the, stuff, the real bad stuff nobody ever sees. Right. Like, so. Right. Yeah, I got no, I got, you know, I got no complaints. It's but hard to. I was lucky in that period of time, I was lucky to be able to work with really good people and really good directors worked with Oliver Stone a bunch, great actors. So, yeah. you know, I worked with Nicholson and twice. Not um, just great actors, like literally the best actors. <laughs> yeah. I worked with James Earl Jones. I did an after school special with James Earl Jones. And then I was in Field of Dreams with James Earl Jones. Right. So, yeah. hey, James Earl Jones is doing those after school specials too. So it ain't too bad. To do he was, that. yeah, yeah. He, he was, he was in the first after school special I did. I think it was the first one, but it was about survivalists. And it was ridiculous, but um, yeah, for, and somehow I, you know, James Earl Jones popped up there. And then when I met him on Field of Dreams, when I bumped, you know, when, when we worked together on Field of Dreams, I said, we worked together on an after school special. And he said, I never did an after school special. <laughs> I said, okay. Um, yeah, well, you don't argue with James Earl Jones on that kind of thing. I said, I'm not going to argue with you. You're yeah. bigger than me. Yeah. Um, but yes. And I uh, did another, I did a CBS school break special, um, which is the only thing I remember about it was that Melba Moore was in it. Oh, and yeah, I, that's right. Yeah, and I had, and Uta Hagen. So. That's an odd. The only time, I believe the only time Melba Moore and Uta Hagen worked together. <laughs> well, yeah, because that cop series they did didn't get picked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> but that would actually have been really good. I would have watched that all day. But I had this time. So you're growing up in upstate New York and, you know, my experience there is like Lake George with like, what's that awful wax museum, uh, Dracula's castle. If you ever went to that thing, it was just, Oh, and Lake George. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's uh, some crazy there. Lake George is a place stuck in time. Oh yeah. It's still the same. So the last time I was, there was there a few couple of years ago and it's, 
It's like the arcades and those weird motels. <laughs> it's 1960 <laughs> forever. Yeah. Um, but yeah. We, so you're watching a lot of TV that we picked an issue here from October 11th to the 17th, 1975. And before we started yeah. talking, you were saying, you know, I realized I was watching a ton of TV at this time. Yeah. Well, I, we, we had one television. It was, you know, yay big. I remember it was a Bradford. <laughs> um, and I think it was bought at Grant's. I remember Grant, like that's where, that's where it came. It was black and white. And it was a kind you had to get up to change, you know, and uh, there was three channels. And sometimes you get P- uh, channel 13. Sometimes you get PBS, but pretty much the ba- the three basics. Four kids in your family? Yeah. I have an older brother, an older sister, and a younger sister. All right, so you're right in the middle. So you probably yeah. didn't have a lot of say in what you were watching either. Like you were just kind of a victim of what they chose, I imagine. Pretty much we were all the victims of our father. Okay. <laughs> my, father, my father was a, 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 an alcoholic with a gambling problem. Um, Are we also, related? <laughs> and, also, and, and also hot-tempered. So he checks all the boxes. But because of his gambling issues if there was sports and sports in 1975 sports wasn't on tv except for yeah. on weekends and on Mon- monday night baseball and but he always had money on the games and there was two games on my job was to sit in front of the tv and when he snapped his fingers i would change the channel to the other game Jeez. yeah and he also had a little radio where he was trying to like listen to like the tigers and expos or the you know the the, the expos and the phillies so if there was a game on then that's what we watch and i didn't mind because i loved i love sports too my mother was the same way we used to have football square map on the wall and like bookies <laughs> calling you know and like i had no idea because i wasn't a sport and be like mom what's a line what it what who's the over uh, what is this you know that's exactly yep. the parlays yep if my father we would always whatever team my what my father had if we would just we would be rapidly rooting for that team yeah. because if we lost, we're all screwed. It's a good way to get kids invested in a sport. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's how I became such a sports fan. Yeah. When my sister passed away, it was nice because her bookie came to the wake uh, in a velvet <laughs> tracksuit, <laughs> which okay. I thought was real classy of him. But I, yeah. I somehow escaped that gene in my family. But on a less gambly point, there right. wasn't major sports on TV that much. And in 1975, the number one sport on television was bowling. We had bowling for dollars on a local a local show. I think it was on channel on, on NBC called Bowling for Dollars. It was on 730. Huge. Like enormously, yeah. like bigger than football. <laughs> yeah. Bowling was a big thing. I, I mean, there was bowling alleys all over the place. And now nobody's ever going to go bowling again. I don't know, though. I'm thinking like in the COVID age, you could film bowling pretty easily. <laughs> like if we need to do a sport on TV. Oh, yeah. It's strange. Like the things, what is it called? Cornhole? Oh, yeah. <laughs> People like I, I would turn on the, I would, you know, when, turn on TV in the middle of the day and like there's a cornhole tournament on. Um, I just like the and the men, yeah. they have like they have um sponsors on their shirts. Yeah. <laughs> Who's sponsoring the, the this this cornhole player? <laughs> Look, uh know. we couldn't get NASCAR, but I have yeah. the second best thing. Yeah. <laughs> cornhole. <laughs> is that a player? Who is that a game? Yeah. These guys were hella good cornhole players. Oh yeah. I mean, they, they were I mean, amazing. From like sixty feet away, like and and not only getting it in the cornhole, which is a really unfortunate name for a game. It truly is. But they would be like strategically knocking the other guy's bags off. And the one guy, one guy, one contestant had like a thermos like this in his hand while he while he played. Like that was his thing. <laughs> yeah, that was his thing. So was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, that guy. They gotta make a movie. Oh yeah, they gotta make a movie about that. They gotta make a cornhole movie. The cocky cornhole player with his uh, flask in hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like it's not even. It's like who, I was wondering. What was it was red in color. It was like like a thermos, and he was just like standing there, sort of in the, put put it sort of in close to his underarm, and just <laughs> the, the, with the mirrored sunglasses. Yeah. Just cool as ice, that guy. Yeah, the the fringier sports they show on like ESPN two in the late night hours. Oh, it, like they used to show Scrabble tournaments, Magic yeah. the Gathering tournaments, the strongman competitions, which were always amazing with like a guy yeah. squatting a box full of women. Like, yeah, I can't, even, I can't even. It's painful to watch. Or yeah. the 
the chain, the, the guys cutting the wood. Oh yeah. The, the lumberjack games. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, all right, man. Um, so, yeah. so it sounds like you were, you were kind of just eager to get out of there as soon as you could, I imagine. Oh yeah. yeah. I did. I got as soon the minute I could, I got out of there. In fact, I was lucky in that I got involved in a program called the educational opportunity program, which allowed me, which otherwise I would not have been able to allow me a, like a state university education completely covered by the government. And it, I graduated in June and, and like three weeks later, I was gone, gone for, for, you know, and I never, never went back. So would you, did you go to Albany? My, my, yeah, I, I went, well, I went to my freshman year. I went to a little college called Potsdam college, which was a horrible mistake because <laughs> everybody wanted to kick my ass because I had earrings and, you know, it was like, it was punk. It was the 80, 1981. I was like, you know, I look like, uh, you know, Adam Ant. Right. right, right. <laughs> we got <laughs> Prince Charming over here. Yeah. It's yeah, not that like, did not fly in upstate deep, well, like up by Canada. No, they yeah. they, you know, these guys, they didn't like that. As a former punk rock kid, when I try to convey to people that if you dressed punk rock, that was just an invitation to get your ass kicked. Yeah. People don't understand. I'm like, no, no. If you have a leather jacket on, you're walking down the street, dudes in a truck would just throw a bottle at you. Yeah. I found the only other punk rock kid on campus and we kind of tried to stay stay alive but i i wore like i wore, wore like a hot pink jacket with old lady brooches <laughs> i mean i i had I, I was taking my life in my hands in potsdam new york but, and, and i was a theater major <laughs> I mean, like, well that goes yeah. without saying i mean you got yeah so brooches. but i was not i was i was fair game but then i i, I transferred uh, to more of a metropolitan feel i went to uh transfer to albany yeah because so you so, start moving east gradually because right, yeah. right when you graduated, were you like, I'm going to Manhattan? That's the next, that's what I got to do? The minute I finished my last exam, I got on the bus, got on the Greyhound bus. I had my, you know, I, I played drums at the time. I was playing drums a lot. I, I had my drums, which I didn't have cases for. So I had them in heavy duty industrial garbage bags. Nice. No lie. And I, I, have, and I had $500 in my pocket. And I borrowed. I moved to New York. Had you ever been there before? Uh, briefly, like yeah. uh, like once or twice while I was in college at Albany. But yeah, but that's, I mean, it's a whole new world. <laughs> it's a whole new world. And this was spring of 1985, uh, Manhattan. New York City is much different than talking basket case or like forty, you know, uh, Times Square sort of uh, scary. Yeah, New York it was State. pre pre Disney fied. Manhattan is relatively safe any any neighborhood you go in, but then there were many neighborhoods, and and I was living in the East Village at the time, which was really a dangerous place, but. Uh, it was exciting. It was really exciting. Yeah, I imagine that's just like, wow, I'm, this is this is the big time now. Because when you're watching TV as a kid, being far away from anything that makes movies or television, New York or LA, which feel like millions of miles away, and you're really only experiencing them through the things you watch, what was your sort of touchstone for, for when you moved there? Like, what'd you think? Because I'm like, Warriors, Barney Miller. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Barney Miller. Barney Miller, definitely. Although it was shot on a soundstage. Yeah. In, in Burbank, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say odd couple because of the opening sequence that da, 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 you know, and, and yep. the, those scenes of Manhattan and films that I'd say, I didn't see a lot of films. We didn't see when I was a kid, we didn't see a lot of movies, but Taxi <clears throat> again, that was I'm sure shot, you know, in Los Angeles and there were no exteriors to speak of, but just the idea of it. I mean, I dreamed, I dreamed of it. I really did of a high rise. Nothing that I imagined was there, especially my early days there before I started working it was just, I, I mean, my first apartment, I was sharing, I was sleeping on a, I wouldn't even call it a cot. It was like a, uh, an ottoman between this little galley kitchen and the front door. Wow. And it was like, yeah, I, I had a sublet in these village and there was at least eight other people living in that apartment and none of them were nice people. We were all unceremoniously thrown out when the building found out that we were all illegally subletting this place. And then I was then I was temporarily homeless for a little while. I mean, got, got, yeah, I mean, got, got kind of scary, but I never for a minute didn't know I was gonna, going to be okay and get you know, confidence. The only way to move is up at that point. Kind of what else are you going to do to me? Yeah, yeah. I, and, and you got to hustle. You know, I, I just, you know, I didn't have any money. And so there were a lot of, there was a lot of shoplifting involved, a lot of just living day to day. And then I got lucky. You know, I got really lucky. A lot, a lot of actors struggle for a lot longer than I had to. And a lot, most of them give it up and don't have to move on to something else, do something else. And I, I got really lucky in the beginning to just kind of go from one thing to another quickly 
and and uh, you know a lot of the more high profile. So I was able to get to where I wanted to be and swift and swift progression. Did you have an opportunity to enjoy it in the moment, or were you kind of too busy? Was your head kind of spinning, just moot? You know, you're just running in place to try and you know stay afloat. I didn't. I no. I never really enjoyed it. I mean, I I was always afraid of going away. I was always afraid. Like most of you hear a lot. Of, you hear a lot of time actors talk about how they always think it's their last opportunity, and I that was my you know constantly my my frame of mind. I was always afraid that they're gonna figure it out that I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then I did the obvious thing from someone from my background and began to try to sabotage my own success. So the more successful I got, the more I was convinced that I didn't deserve the success and right. that's the thing and or didn't deserve it or I didn't, you know, I tried to get in my own way. I had to get through a period of that and come out the other side to really appreciate my own talent, what I had achieved and and move forward. I'm most proud that I was able to come through that period you know the success most of it has to do with luck it's just luck timing being in the right place at the right time and a little bit of talent and and having something i think genuine i I think i offered some intangible thing that nobody else nobody else had i think that's always been my best quality and it took me a long time to realize and to you know pat myself on the back for that what you've just described makes perfect sense that you wrote the Jimmy show as a stand up because I'm like, yep, you got it. <laughs> like, the kind of like, if I'm going to fail, I'm going to do it myself. No one's going to do it to me. That movie, I'll say, made, made uh, $750 at the box office because it's, uh, it, it's so, it's so sort of dark. Actually, based, I actually adapted that from a one act play that I had done called Banes and Thumbtacks that um, an old friend of mine, Ethan Hawke, directed. Uh, we had a theater company at the time, early 90s. And this character, he works in a grocery store in New Jersey. He lives with his ailing grandmother who's in a wheelchair and his wife and his ta- young daughter in New Jersey. And one day decides to um, embark on a career as a stand-up comic. But he has no sense of humor, no jokes, and no comic timing. So he does it for seven years, you know, open mic nights amateur comedy and yeah. it's awful. I mean, I think I, I've met that guy many times along the way. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, the more I found out about stand-up comedy, because it's, as you know, it's a dark alley. I saw this documentary once, Jerry Seinfeld documentary. Oh, comedian, yeah. You, yeah, and the best thing about it was the other guy. That, there's a lot of, Jim, there's the, the, the character in um, Jimmy's show, there's a lot of that. That, uh, that guy was much funnier than Jimmy, but the same sense of over uh, sense of self that yep. guy was the best comedian in the world he couldn't yeah. understand why he was funny. but the thing about jimmy is i don't think he cared much about being funny he just wanted to be heard and so that you know that this guy wanted to be you know, the guy in comedian right. wanted to be funny. that was that was interesting cheaper than therapy basically <laughs> yeah right. that's right that's what i was supposed to say he couldn't afford therapy so he just you know, it's open mic nights eugene merman used to have a great comedy festival in, in brooklyn year after year and they would it was kind of a parody of a comedy festival but one yep. of the shows he had once was called great guy terrible comedian <laughs> <laughs> he was like it was really it was really bad to book but you know we had these people so let's dive in here on saturday night what'd you do well i would say at eight the jeffersons and then let's see, I would go from the Jeffersons. There's not a uh, lot of choices at 830. You got a show yeah. I've never heard of called Doc. No, yeah, I don't know that one. I don't know that one. But Mary Tyler Moore, I like that show a lot, mostly because I kind of had a crush on her. Yeah, I think everyone did. And that's just such a good show that holds up so well. It's really good. Yeah, like um, Ed Asner, like the whole group is so good. And Ted, uh, my favorite was um, Ted Baxter, played by Ted Knight. That guy was brilliant. I mean, he's one of the funniest actors there ever was. And, but that character was brilliant. And I loved that. I loved a lot. A lot of my choices were based on, you know, women I had crushes on. Yeah, that's like, how we watch things as kids. <laughs> yeah. And then Bob Newhart, mostly because I loved Suzanne Plachette, who played his wife on that show. Do you know the story of how she got cast on that? No. Nah. So she was not a comedic actress at all. She did like pretty heavy, serious stuff. And the producers of what would become the Bob Newhart show saw them on the Tonight Show on a panel together, promoting two different things, and oh, went wow. like, "Oh, they got a good chemistry," and then cast her in this comedy, and she's great in it. She's so good because she's she's um, she was always. I mean, she, to, for me, she was always so just so sexy, but her voice, she had like like smoky voice. I met her. 
my first one, um, my, my first, I think my manager a long, long time ago, but I represented her. I, for a while I had an agent who I was by 30 years, his youngest client. <laughs> he represent. he still does represent Betty White and, and Suzanne Plachette, like Tom Poston. Oh, wow. And he would invite me to his party. He would invite me to parties at his house. And I'd be like, this is going to be great. And, like, have a party. and the median age was 90. <laughs> Nine o'clock. They're like, we're wrapping it up. <laughs> yeah. Like they're sitting drinking, like, you know, like Asia. but she, 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 she smoked, you know, like the thing I remember she was at this time when I met her, she was in her, probably in her seventies. I don't know how, how old she was, but she was like chain smoking Virginia Slims. Oh and yeah. Light one with the other. <laughs> Get the thing in there. Yeah. I'd say, oh, I grew up watching you. And she's like, I'm not that old. <laughs> was she the only childhood crush you got to meet? No. Not, she, um, I, I also loved Anne Margaret. And I met her once. I, I did a play off Broadway with Rita Moreno. She invited so many heavy hitters to, to see the show. And um, she invited, I mean, I got to meet Burt Reynolds. Burt Reynolds came. And we went out afterward. And Burt Reynolds smelled so much like high karate. Of course. I, 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 almost, I almost passed. I mean, I was having like a reaction to it. I almost passed out. I imagine he just sweated that. Like he didn't even have any on. <laughs> and a belt buckle that was like three times the size of my head. <laughs> boots, jeans that like were so tight. I don't know how he had any circulation. <laughs> he had a cowboy hat, which I could see from the stage. And this high karate. And I remember he, we, he kept on putting his hand on, on my inner thigh. <laughs> so I remember we were at the, at the dinner. At the dinner, I'd be like, you know what? Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> but I got to meet Anne Margaret and actually this is a longer story, but um, we went out afterward when Anne Margaret came to see the show and I actually got to briefly make out with Anne Margaret. Oh, wow. Uh, you were already one of my heroes, but now I, it's in stone. I, you know, like, and it wasn't like, I, I had nothing to do with it. It was all her. <laughs> it has, that's what's great about it. Yeah. She, she just, she, 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 she announced to me, I'm gonna. We were very, there was a lot of um, alcohol involved. Of I'm gonna kiss you. I, I rested before I could finish the word. Really, she was kissing me. She is the female Elvis. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> this my is, greatest moment. That I I I would put that on my resume. Uh, you know what? I'd put it on my gravestone. That's how impressed I am by that. So, anything else on Saturday night? I probably would watch Carol Burnett. But the, the really interesting thing about this week is Saturday Live. It premieres this night. That's crazy, and and so I probably I probably I think I did watch that, and now had George Carlin was the host, Albert Brooks, the Muppets. Yep, which everyone forgets, the Muppets were in the whole first season. Yeah, that's crazy. And Janice Ian and Billy Preston. There couldn't be two more different musical guests. Billy Crystal, Andy Kaufman. I'm sure I watch that. It was called Saturday Night because um, Saturday Night Live was already taken by Howard Cosell. It's also a show that I love. I've never seen that one, the Howard Cosell sketch show. It was really good. I remember seeing the Bay City Rollers. Nice. Um, I, I loved, the, like, at, at this period of time, I loved Bay City Rollers. In fact, it, Bay City Rollers wasn't, wasn't really a disco group, but my I loved... I got, and this did not go well, uh, over well in my upstate New York high school. I loved disco music. I really did. And, but most of the people where I, where I, where I grew up, they loved like, you know, Led Zeppelin. And yeah. And, they were a disco but, sucks crowd. They were burn the records crowd. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was not, that was, that was not my thing, but, but often Howard Cosell would have like cool, like cool hacks on oh nice yeah this it's funny seeing this ad so it's a full page ad for saturday saturday live uh yeah. nbc saturday Night live and just to see what it became and the fact that it's still on it's insane to see this just another show kind of ad in here and the way it's described is a variety series that blends a range of musical acts with a topical brand of comedy as sketches and Blackouts, I don't know what Blackouts are, from regulars, um, Albert Brooks, Jim Henson, and the Muppets, and a repertory group. Blackouts is like a vaudeville term, which is even funnier that it's in here. So there's sketches that just end with a blackout, a literal, that's how it ends. Oh, shit. Huh. So they were what? like, yeah, it was literally like a vaudeville term. So it's like some 90-year-old guy wrote the description in here. Another great thing that was on at that time was Don Kirshner's rock concert, which I also loved. And um, on this on this episode he has uriah heap and he has uh eddie kendricks who i loved eddie kendricks and um Mirabai. i don't know i don't know i'm not familiar with either Mirabai. but 
Anyway, on, uh, uh, before Saturday Night Live came on, I used to watch rock concert a lot. But a lot. it was the variety of acts they would have on that kind of thing was just amazing. And you probably only had like Top 40 and, you know, Led Zeppelin Radio where you grew up and being able to see like, especially black acts, like things like Soul Train and stuff, seeing the right. band, uh, it was amazing. Yeah, I loved Soul Train. I loved Midnight Special also had a lot of soul acts on. And I loved, um, I remember seeing um, Rufus Ashaka Khan and, who, that was what you know. I love that um, that first Rufus Shaka Khan album when that came out. I just remember like w- waiting up and watching watching that. And fortunately, I, you know, I was either people either nobody was home at that hour, or everybody was asleep, right? You know, passed out, so I could watch in peace. Did you have to do like ear to the speaker, have it real low? <laughs> I had to keep it pretty low. Yeah, yeah, I had to keep it pretty low because I at the house, my house, you know. Um, my, I, I remember the first time I brought my kids to my, to my mom still lives in the house that I grew up in. And, um, my kids, when they went in, they were like, <laughs> oh, ceilings, the ceilings right there. Dad. <laughs> yeah. Where's, where's the other bathroom? <laughs> Is it? It's at the gas station. <laughs> Go walk. Yeah. The restaurant. Yeah. The yard. <laughs> where isn't it um yeah it's uh it, it's amazing to to look back and see like how we got through those things or just with no privacy to your, yourself and, and how's we were up in no i had there wasn't a, there wasn't a uh, you know there was very few locks on any doors and you know um yeah yeah i remember like my bathroom was really small in the house so you could like you had to hold on to the handle yeah the door. <laughs> but, uh, relieving yourself like no i'm in here yeah occupied <laughs> it's defensive bathrooming it's like a, yeah you're like a goalie <laughs> if you want to spend any special time with yourself you know forget it oh that ain't happening no you need a lookout and no one wants to get a, a second person involved at that point <laughs> no you have to get real creative yeah you have, to let, you, know. you have to literally move to manhattan that's the only way to do it yeah <laughs> There's very little. There's very little time, and or you have to be very fast. You have to have it planned out. Yeah, <laughs> you have to have you have to have all the scenes planned in advance. It's like a heist movie. Yeah, <laughs> You're doing doing a dry run. It's yeah. Act one. Yep. Okay, act two. No intermission. No time at all. In and out. No one gets harmed. Perfect. Yeah. All supplies. Keep everything. Happy. This got this and this. Everything's ready. Right. Go. Leave no Hold man behind. Hand. Hold on to the handle. <laughs> Anything on Sunday night? The Lord's night. Speaking of that. Sunday, uh, Sunday, Sunday night was, um, uh, well, I noticed that on Sunday night, there was um, a good movie on, which I loved. And I probably saw it. I probably saw it on this viewing, on this broadcast. Because this is a New York edition. Uh, yeah. Um, and Cin- um, Cinderella Liberty which is James Caan and, and Marsha Mason. And, and Bruce uh, Kirby. Um, who's Bruno Kirby's father. Uh, I got to, got to work with on The Freshman. Great, great guy. But that was a great movie. It's all about this sailor who falls in love with this single mother, also happens to be a prostitute. And, uh, but it's, it's well, I mean, it's well done. I mean, it's kind of, the, the premise is kind of hokey and there's some, some weird moments, but I, I always remembered it being kind of, Really good. You got Dabney Coleman in an early role, much like your own, as his character is named Executive Officer. Yeah, he had a very small role. I remember, I remember Dabney Coleman in there, and uh, Coleman, and uh, but yeah, um, but I probably because I loved um, because I loved uh, Cher so much. I loved I loved the Sonny and Cher show. Mm-hmm. And also, and I, and I followed her to her own, you know, her solo show. Um, I probably would watch Cher. Um, with Anthony which, Newley in this episode. Anthony Newley. I love Anthony Newley. He did Candyman before Sammy Davis Jr. did Candy, yeah. Candyman. He um, wrote most of the music for Willy Wonka. Uh, he was a kind of an old-fashioned song and dance kind of guy. Who else was on Cher? Um, oh, I can Tina Turner was on, were on that, that episode. So that must have been like an amazing episode of that show. The last year of I can Tina Turner kind of being a thing publicly. Like this was tail end. They did um, that song. Oh, River they, Deep, Mountain High. Great song, yeah. So um, that's probably my one of the you know my favorite I Can Tina Turner songs. And then uh, at eight thirty, you have um, Flip Wilson, right? Oh Is yeah, eight thirty. Yeah. Well, actually, no, you got um, you got um, Columbo. Yes. Which is one of the great all time characters, television characters. I've always dreamed of having my own Columbo. <laughs> you would uh, want to do that, like in a series. I'd love it. Yeah. 
But, you know, these days you don't see many uh, Peter Falk types on TV. The closest thing you probably got was like Buddy Farrow or something, I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But, I mean, nowadays, you know, people on TV are, are really good looking, kind of handsome types. And, they don't, you know, they don't put quirky type of characters um, on TV so much anymore. And, uh, but, yeah, Buddy Farrow was fun. That was yeah. fun. Really great Dennis Farina. I love Dennis Farina. Uh, he was uh, he was great. And then uh, let's see, ten. Uh, uh, um, and then um, I used I used to love Bronk. Remember Bronk? No, I don't know that show. It wasn't on long, but I remember I loved Jack Palance. He was the central character. I'd probably catch that. I probably watch uh, Bronk. Was and it a uh, cop show was he like the cop? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. he's a, he, yeah he's he's a he's a. Uh, it's a crime. It's a crime show. From what I remember of it, it was real hard scrabble. It was, it was edgy. It's Jack Palance. It has to be. <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, and he was. Yeah, he's he was great on it. He was great on the show. So that's that's Sunday. It's a solid Sunday. Monday, what'd you do? Sunday, uh, Sunday I was never. Ne- Sunday was never a big. You know, with uh, aside from share share show, which which. I remember it wasn't always on Sunday. I remember it being on weeknight, but yeah. I loved all those party shows. Tom Jones. I loved the Tom Jones show when that was on. I loved uh, uh, Cher. I loved Glenn Campbell had a show. Yep. The Bay City Rollers had a variety show. The Rollers had a show. Yeah. I loved, I mean, I loved all those, all those variety shows because to get to get skits, skits are always really dorky, but the music usually was pretty good. But the, the great thing about the skits are, you know, a lot of them blackouts was you'd see like William Conrad doing like a, like a song and dance hell's a poppin' thing. And you're like, what? This is just weird. You know, they, they always hit, you know, whoever was on the lot that day, you know, or was going to be on the lot that week. Like, you know, they were, uh, I remember seeing, um, like Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, like what show? <laughs> hey, and they would do some stupid, stupid or you know, John Wayne would show up. Yeah, Muhammad Ali. Yeah, you know? who was always surprisingly good. He has amazing comedic timing. Sterile. Yeah, really funny. It's funny, you know, you you have this love for these comedic things and and these sort of musical theater, th- uh, musical theater, you know, like musical variety shows. But that's not a lot of the work that you've done. Is is more. Uh, you know, you play the quirky character in it, but it's it's more heavy drama stuff. I know, and that's unfortunate because you know, I I always I do I do love comedy, and you know, like I at the times I've had the 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 times I've been able to do it, I've really been able to to shine, and you know, like I've done a couple of failed sitcom pilots, um, The Freshman, you know, that was that was humorous. Career opportunities is one of my Career favorites. Buddy Farrow. I tried to infuse a lot of comedy into that. That was a, um, you know, Mark Frost who did um, Twin Peaks, responsible for Twin Peaks and something else too. He did a show called On the Hour with David Lynch later. That was like a set radio sort of sitcom. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That didn't go anywhere, but he did something before Twin Peaks. Something kind of big, but he wasn't the main guy there. Right. But um, I tried to, I tried to make that as kind of comic as possible. And phys- I tried to, you know, I tried to do a lot of physical comedy in that. And I had a couple of opportunities after that, but I was not in the position to go do anything. I got close to doing, um, believe it or not, I got really close to doing uh, Two and a Half Men. Oh, um, wow. The John Cryer part? Yeah. It, would, it really came down to he and I. And, um, and maybe one other actor i don't remember but i really wanted to do that that would change the whole trajectory in terms of my comic roles mostly known for the for the heavy drama because you are so good at comedy i mean just the you know especially like crypto is a favorite of mine even just the scene with you and john candy is amazing (laughs) well you know he elevated it he's you know he's a master he's he was so you know he and and you know he let a good a good a good comedian or a good actor like listens and that was all improvised. I don't see him really. It was just completely a lot, a lot of, a lot of what works in that film um, was just kind of made up. Yeah. You can tell, I mean, it has a different tone than other stuff that, you know, other Hughes scripts and stuff. Yeah. And I, I always say about that movie, if, if they jettisoned the home alone robbers, <laughs> it ah. just was about two people in the, you know, in, in one night talking, that would be like the indie hit film of the nineties. <laughs> Yeah, they yeah they did <clears throat> they did add that element to it, and it didn't really. I I never you know I mean I wasn't in any kind of position to say anything, but it was much more interesting character study 
just those two. Yeah. Those two and their families that would have been a much better thing but you know i mean but also they put her in like and you know they dressed her in next to nothing and all yeah that. they kind of sexualized that whole thing she's a whole generation suzanne plachette there <laughs> <laughs> people know that film they know it for you know one reason well one reason. i still but quote hobo chicken on a on a almost weekly basis one of my favorite parts i've ever done well, I, I was I did an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, speaking of improvisation, which which that was very really fun and funny. But there was a movie called Drill Bit Taylor. Oh yeah, with um Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson, and um, and I have like a little bit in that film. I have like you know that it's my favorite thing I've done because it's all just you know it's a very funny little thing. But I'd love to do more of that. I wish Judd Apatow, you know. I'll put in a word for you. Yeah, let him know. <laughs> I'll let him know. I'll give him a call. Anything else on Monday or are we on to Tuesday? Let's see. Um, I think Monday, <clears throat> which is Rhoda show. Again, you know, I had a thing for Valerie Harper. I had a thing for all those Mary Teller Moore spinoff women. You Even know? Phyllis? Yeah. I like, I, you know, one of my favorite films is the Last Picture Show. And her role in that, which she does, like, you know, she has an affair with, uh, is it Timothy Bottoms? But I, I mean, she was supposed to be an old maid, I film, but I still thought she was ex- extremely. She was pretty great at, um, with the suitcase that Pulp Fiction was influenced by. Uh, Kiss oh, Me Deadly. She's, I mean, she's, she's always been so great. I was, I was in a film with her, but we didn't have any scenes together, which, which was called Mrs. Harris, which was about the murder of Cla- Klaus von Bülow. It was an HBO film. I got to work with and I think, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, that was one of the thrills of my life, getting to work with her. I got to, I got to play like the prosecuting attorney, you know, all based obviously on real, on real life and working with Annette Benning. There's moments like being a, across from her, watching her work was actually, you know, you hear, all, you hear the actor say, oh, I learned a lot, but I actually did learn. There's a couple of experiences in my life. When you're playing a real person, because you've done it a few times, Robbie Krieger, you know, these other people, is it a benefit to learn a lot about them or meet them, or is it kind of a hindrance? Well, in this case, with this, with this Mrs. Harris, he was, he was just, you know, there wasn't much about him. He was kind of a bland, like, crossing attorney. So I was able, it was, I saw that as an opportunity just to create something, create, you know, create the character and. And um, he was constantly being f- f- flustered by Mrs. Harris, played by Annette Benning a bit. But, but yeah, no, I mean, um, it was great spending time, you know, on, on the doors. I got to, I spent a great deal of time with Robbie. That was great. I played Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, in, twice, in right? Twice, but, uh, sort of, yeah. yeah. I mean, one an imposter and the other was in a movie called Marina and Lee. Uh, was that what it was called? A funny title. It was with Helena Bonham Carter. It was about, it was about, um, Marina and Lee Oswald and their and their romance. And that was a TV and movie, I think, right? It was a TV. It was a yeah. TV movie. It was, TV, it was released in, in in Europe as theatrically, but and US it was on was on television. She was nominated for for, for like a an Emmy, I think, for her performance. I just read a lot about him and tried to, you know, I I tried on like his mannerisms and stuff like that in front of a mirror, and I thought, I'm not even gonna bother. I'm just gonna do my thing. And, right. and critics said an interesting spin on Lee Harvey. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not like anyone's going to be like, this is not a believable Lee Harvey Oswald, because you're not doing an impression of someone that no one really saw any footage of. No, exactly. I mean, well, I mean, you know, Gary Oldman, because there's there's a little, there's like the, the most famous is, you know, I'm a patsy. I didn't, uh, there's a couple of, there's a couple of feet of film on Lee Harvey and he, and, and, and he kind of did that. It was, uh, but he, he resembles him a little bit anyway, but no, I didn't, I didn't really try to do that. I was, that's something that, you know, I'm not Frank Gorshin, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to try to impersonate somebody. And I think that's boring anyway to do that. How many times a day do you have to say, I'm not Frank Gorshin to people? I mean, <laughs> I'm walking down the street and say, oh, are you Frank Gorshin? And I have to say, I'm not Frank Gorshin. <laughs> and they're like, weren't you the Riddler? And be like, no, that was Frank Gorshin. It's not Frank Gorshin used to terrify me. Like something about him seems scary. I always, uh, whenever, when I, I remember first seeing Jim Carrey, I was thinking, he's, he's just like Jim, Frank Gorshin. Like Frank Gorshin was brilliant. Um, he showed up on a lot of these variety shows. Oh, yeah. Is, like when you watch, when, you, when, you, when you're when you watching television at this period of time, you're seeing a lot of variety shows, a lot of talk shows, and people like Frank Gorshin show up on them all the time. Um, Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin. Tonight, we have Frank Gorshin and Faye Dunaway. Frank Gorshin will come on and do a bunch of, do a bunch of impressions. But he seemed like he he'd just like punch you too. Like he seemed like a guy that would like throw it out. 
I'm sure, I'm sure that he would go home, drink, gamble, and be mean to his kids, just like my father. Yeah, that's right. That's, he does impressions of everyone's dad. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, anything on Tuesday? When you get a chance, if you have it between Monday and Tuesday, it's the Indian summer sub. Like the, this TV guy. Yep. To see these, these, these recipes. Oh, God, yes. Those are bizarre. That's like there's the fat, the frost, frosty citrus mold. There's a dish called frosty citrus mold. What's for dinner? Frosty citrus mold. <laughs> you can hear the door, the front door opening, and me running up. Yeah, I, there are people who do whole blogs and like YouTube channels where they make '70s recipes. Yam Mallow Crisp. That stuff looks awful. No wonder everyone was so thin then. That and the cocaine. Mostly the cocaine. <laughs> Watch Cher. You see Cher's like, it's like she's, if she turns sideways, you can't see her. So where we were on Tuesday. So Tuesday, yes. um, Tuesday is a good day because it's good times, which was my favorite uh, at that time. My favorite show got to work with Esther Roll. I got to work with John Amos, two of my favorite actors. Great, serious actors too, like heavy actors. Man, you know, you look, look at um, what Esther Roll did before that. In terms of theater and and stuff and, and New York theater and Good Times was a, a like a really groundbreaking show. Norman Lear, you know that guy, he created some of the greatest memorable television and and groundbreaking television. Television, but Good Times was groundbreaking for so many different reasons. But Esther Roll insisted that you know John Amos, the John Amos character, be a part of that because she wanted to have a central like father figure in that family. But also another, another thing that I that I learned about Esther Roll was that when they started getting hokey, JJ, JJ took over. JJ started taking over and dynamite. All that yeah. stuff. He left. She said, I mean, "This is not what I signed up for." Ultimately, came back for the for the end. I mean, and John Amos saying John John Amos loved, they killed him off, and um, yeah, I loved it. I loved I loved good times. I did a show in Reno, Nevada, last November, and the lineup was me, Jimmy Walker. <laughs> And Murray Langston, the unknown comic. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. One of those things, not like the other. Wow. <laughs> it was a weird How was show. JJ? How was, how, was, how was... I've done shows with him a couple times, and he's a weird dude. He's, yeah, he's yeah. strange. He, uh, he always does the same thing where he'll come up to you and be like, nothing dirty. Nothing yeah. dirty in your set. And then he'll go up and immediately go on this filthy rant. <laughs> Yeah, it's just incredible. Audience loved it. So, well, you know, yeah. Reno. What are yeah. you doing, Reno? It's true. Well, the amazing thing about him too is that he used to personally employ people like David Letterman as yeah. writers when in yeah. the '70s, when because he was flush with cash from Good Times. So he was, you know, Gary Shandling, all those guys. He was keeping them employed, writing jokes for him. Yeah. No, he. My um, my little sister had a Jimmy Walker, uh, JJ um, uh, lunchbox, Dino Mike yeah. lunchbox. He, he was he was huge and he took over that show and you know they they made it all about him and then you know i sort of saw, I, I i remember when when they jumped that shark and i remember losing interest because i loved it. i mean i liked him when he was like painting and he had aspirations to be a creative person in a tough situation i mean it's in cabrini green it's the it's it's the projects from candy man it's the same oh, setting yeah exactly i love that one and then after good times you had Welcome back, Carter. Which I couldn't ever get into. That's surprising. Yeah, you got a stand-up comedian in the center, Gabe, Gabe Kaplan. True, but it was uh, just so broad for me. I have something about it. It was broad. Oh, totally broad. But I think I think Travolta was actually really. I think that's his. Might be aside from Pulp Fiction. Well, Saturday Night Fever. I mean, Travolta's pretty brilliant, but he was great in that. I thought he was really funny. I mean, he like, mostly has been playing variations on that character in his best roles. Pretty much. And the, but the other characters were stock. I mean, Horshack. Yeah. And the other guy, uh, Epstein. I mean, Epstein was too much, but I like Washington. He was good. He was good in... Um, Lawrence Hilton, I think his name is. Lawrence Hilton. Yeah. Lawrence Hilton Jacobs? Yeah, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. That's right. Yeah, he was... And he, I, I know that he was. he went on to do some, some other stuff that, that was good, but... But I liked it. I, mostly, I would say, because I had a thing for Mr. Carter's wife. wife. She was so super sexy. She had a Bailey from WKRP thing kind of going on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that same type of character. Just smart, together, no nonsense, chick. Look her glass. Yep. Glasses and hair. She also had like a sort of a day young and rock and roll high school thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, was, she, was, she could relate to her. She wasn't Lonnie Anderson. She was somebody approachable. When you met Burt Reynolds, was that when he was with Lonnie Anderson? Uh, this was mid, 
early mid nineties. Oh, okay, but yeah, they they had broken up by then. My favorite Burt Bur- Reynolds period was Sally Field. Bur- Reynolds Sally Field period. That was that was his best. That was his best bat. Cannonball Run was in that era. One of my favorite Burt Reynolds movies. I love the end, the suicide comedy with him and Dom DeLuise. A movie a lot of people haven't seen is Starting Over, where he's the divorcee, Candace Bergen. So good. He's great. I mean, he he. I I, I had a near a near miss with him. I was going to do. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it was an actor named Casey Shamasco. Oh, Casey, Casey Shamasco? Yeah. 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 He was great. Really, really fine actor and great guy. Um, I think it was called Breaking In. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was a comedy where he's a cat burglar. Who's- yeah. And I really wanted to do that. And, and um, I was mostly excited about working working with Burt Reynolds, but it didn't pan out. I got to have my thigh rubbed by him. I mean, and- that's... That's like working with him. He was working with me. It's true. Are you the kind of person who keeps mementos for movies you've done? Like, do you keep things from set or that kind of thing? And I, I used to keep, I used to say everything imaginable. Like, like when, when, when hotels used to give messages on pieces of paper, like used to get pieces of paper, should we come back from a night out? And they yeah. hand, Telegram. I used to keep all that stuff. And then when I had, had kids and realized I don't need all this stuff, like, so most of it I moved into a storage facility, which I haven't been to in many, many, many years. I'll, the rest of it I threw away, but I yeah. used to. Yeah. Is there anything that you pulled out that you have like on display or that you're like, ah, oh, this thing I got to have? Uh, no. No, I mean, I, the only thing I keep on display, which is actually behind me on that shelf, is I have my screenwriting award from the Sundance Film Festival for my, for my film, Joe King. My Lifetime Achievement Award from the Staten Island Film Festival. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it's huge. Very few people get that. Well, you got to take a boat to get it. Yes, actually, not to set down the Stony Brook film. Oh, okay. Stony Brook film. Uh, but no, I, you know, I keep that kind of stuff, and you know, and I, I did hold on. I know I don't display. I don't really display. I'm not that kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll keep like my movie posters. I know actors that keep like all their stuff on. You know, movie posters. Always. Uh, I never. You walk down the hallway and it's just their face everywhere. <laughs> and there's me with, uh, you know. Yeah. York. Yeah. Oh, I, I, well, how funny. Here's the whole picture of things of me. Yeah, that's from my second law and order. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an action still. Do you watch the things you're in? Not anymore. No, I haven't seen. I don't, I don't remember the last thing I watched. Just because you're not interested or it's the sort of magic of it's gone because you kind of know how the sausage is made. All of that, all of the above. And also, I can't bear to look at myself anymore. Like, I remember, I remember when I was a kid, my mom stopped allowing photographs of herself. You know, people, I mean, the old days, people used to pull out a camera and take a picture. She said, no, and no, no more, no more. <laughs> We've no done more. this. She, she got to a certain age where she did not want to look at her photograph anymore. It just, you know, she wanted to remember the old days. She wanted to remember the good old days. So. Right. You know, when I when I catch a glimpse of myself, like I, I like I on the you know like in the era of Zoom, yeah, I avoid it because. And by the way, I apologize. I haven't had a haircut in four months, and this is the longest my hair has been since 1975. It's working. It's working. I I I've been using my poodle my poodle's dog shears on mine. It took a few tests along the way. If there's something I don't yeah. I don't look at it. Because like your great Luke Cage, uh, playing a villainous role, which is kind of unusual for you. That was really fun. Luke Cage was really fun. I was killed off in season one, but yep. then they brought me back in season two in flashbacks. And then there was, so I was talking to Chao Odari Coker, who was the, the, the creator of the showrunner. He, uh, the, like, they were certain it was going to come back for season three. He said, just let you know, we're bringing that guy back. He's coming back. And but not to be. Yeah. Netflix canceled all those Marvel shows. Because the Netflix business model is so bizarre. It's really yeah. weird. Yeah. We just want new subscribers. We don't care if everyone who subscribes watches the things. After two, yeah, after two years, they're like, I, no value to us anymore. <laughs> no, nah, yeah. I mean, with a few exceptions, that's, that's how they work it. Yeah, but it's weird you get it. You've been getting a ton of just like cop roles in the last two decades. Uh, that's yeah. I mean, that seems to be it, really. I mean, the 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 offers are for you know either really creepy weird guys. <laughs> it's kind of I've kind of come full circle because now that I have kids, like I, I can't really be super choosy. And there's a lot more. Co- there's a few fewer films we made, so most of the work is in television. And there's a lot more competition for the kind of roles that I do. So I did a show called uh, CBS all access called interrogation was yep. called and so that was that was that was fun vince d'onofrio was in that and and that was a cop cop role and um yeah so i've been doing a lot of that i don't think 
cop. <laughs> but it um, works. It works. You pull it off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 my, my dream is to write, write, you know, like, like I said before, like a great, you know, if, if it's doable, like great, a great offbeat detective role, you yeah. know, or something that I can, that I can slide into and do. They always call that genre the defective detective. <laughs> That's right. They, they, they do few that they, they're not, there's not very many of those. I mean, they brought back Perry Mason. There's like, but in the old days, there was Mannix, Cannon, Barnaby Jones, yeah. Columbia, like all those guys. But And even the Perry Mason, it's like sexy Perry Mason. It's like sexy young spy Perry Mason. Yeah, it's not the Perry Mason that I know. Yeah, he looked like a cannoli in a suit. <laughs> yeah. But like, look at Cannon. Cannon was like 350 pounds, that guy. Yeah. Or like Ironsides. <laughs> Ironsides. Yeah, yeah he, he was in a wheelchair. Yeah. It's old Raymond Burr in a wheelchair. Like, could you imagine pitching a network on old Raymond Burr in a wheelchair? And they're like, sold. Raymond, Raymond Burr. I, when I watch Iron Sight, I can imagine him belching a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. I talked to this guy, Alan Levi, who directed a ton of like Magnum PI and a bunch of stuff like that. He directed Frank Sinatra in a Magnum PI and he directed Orson Welles in a Columbo. <laughs> it, this was tail end Orson Welles yeah. and uh, his wife's like, Alan, go get the picture of you directing Orson Welles. So he's like, all right. So he goes and gets it and it's Orson Welles in this giant throne. And there's about 10 Yorkie dogs kind of all at his feet. And then Alan directing him. And I'm like, what is going on here? He goes, well, he insisted we fly this chair out to Hawaii and all these dogs. And he insisted on sitting in it and having the dogs and all the shots with him. So I had to shoot around so we couldn't see them because obviously his character doesn't have 10 Yorkie dogs with him. So he had to shoot around all this stuff. And I'm like, man, that's brilliant. They should have, I mean, there should be behind the scenes. They should have <laughs> had the foresight to like shoot B roll of all that. Oh yeah. I mean, that's the kind of stuff where you're like only guys like Brando and Orson Welles and those people could make demands like that. Well, Orson Welles was like, I don't know if you've seen um, they'll love me when I'm dead. Yes. Which that is, if you want to know about Orson Welles, it, behind the, the curtain look at Orson Welles, man, the whole thing with Rich Little, where they brought Rich Little in to play this role, and they like, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> that would be a week, and four weeks later, <laughs> Rich Little's like, I got gigs in Vegas. Yeah. I gotta go impersonate Nixon. <laughs> Gorshin's gonna get my part if I don't cut <laughs> yeah, I'm Frank Gorshin. But then they brought in, they replaced him with Bogdanovich. I was watching, I've been watching a lot of the old um, Dick Cavett shows. Cause they're online yeah. and they're great. And there's one with Orson Welles and he's telling stories about hanging out with Winston Churchill. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. That's when, that's when talk shows like that were less about like, you know, now they're all kind of games and bits and, you know, and, and, but then they, would, they actually just talked. I remember Dick Cavett talking to, um, I, I remember seeing Orson Welles. I don't know if I saw that episode where he's talking about Winston Churchill, but like George C. Scott would come on smoke be smoking and talking wow you know talk, talk the long-winded stories that you had to really pay attention to to follow there's like a three-parter he does with robert mitchum that's one of my favorite things ever because that guy's fascinating crazy life and and they, you know that they came with whatever clothes they put on in the morning they're, they they were they didn't have any, there's no hair and makeup i miss that because like there's a um you can watch it on Amazon, but there's a Dick Cavett episode with Vincent Price and Vincent Price is there to p to plug something, although he never mentions it because it's literally a half hour of him and Dick Cavett talking about Oscar Wilde. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah. mention anything else. It's just them, the two of them being like, oh, and you know what else is great about Oscar Wilde? <laughs> right. They just get there and before you know it, it's like, oh, our time's up. Yep. They're like, oh, we smoked all the cigarettes. So that's what we do. <laughs> Dick Cavett would bring on people that had, 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 Hadn't been in the, in the limelight in some time. So they would just open it like that. I remember Betty Davis. That was great. Yeah. Right? She's just like spilling it all out. They're at that point in their life when they're like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm ready to talk. Yeah. I'm, bring me in. I'm ready. I've been in purgatory long enough. And she, and it's specifically the Betty Davis one, because she has obviously a reputation of being like terrifying, but she comes across as like very funny and self-effacing and charming and just like surprisingly normal in that one. Yeah. Well, she's like, you know, an old lady at that point. She's had time to mellow. I think she brings her purse out with her on stage, which is a yeah, good indicator. I'm sure that there was a time where you wouldn't want to mess with Betty Davis. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what happened to Baby Jane days? It's not. So where are we? Uh, Wednesday, anything? Well, Wednesday, um, Tony Orlando and Dawn. I liked. I liked. Um, and then um, I probably would have watched Beretta and, uh, and then Starsky and Hutch. 
let's talk about them for that block. Have um, you ever gone back and revisited any of these shows or any of the variety shows? Um, once in a while, um, like I remember not long ago on there's a network that plays like it's for geriatrics. Oh, me TV. You can watch episodes of Columbo, which this first the, the first thing that pops out is the sound quality. It sounds like like there's a hiss under everything. <laughs> like the, the the technology is horrible. Columbo is not 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 bad. I mean, the plots are pretty thick, but there's some interesting performances. But I remember catching an episode of Mannix, which I kind of, when I was a kid, I remember loving and thinking Mannix was the kind of guy I could relate to. But it's just awful. I mean, how much hairspray and <laughs> the acting is atrociously bad. The plotting is terrible and the, the soundtrack. <laughs> it's like, they don't hold up. Shows like that where you watch them now and you realize, oh, this was not meant to be watched more than once. <laughs> yeah, and not meant to be watched in, in you know 30 years from now. <laughs> but some of them hold up. The variety shows actually weirdly kind of hold up because they're so cheesy and weird. They're almost somewhat timeless. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you, and when you see Cher and Michael Jackson dancing together, David Bowie. Yeah, and Bing Crosby. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, you, you, that, that's, th yeah, those are different. I mean, like, but the scripted programming is, it's iffy. You are 100% correct. But on Wednesday, let's see, Wednesday was kind of chock full, like, of cool, like, it was so interesting looking at this because it was some of the stuff I forgot, completely forgot about, some of the incidental, like, like Mike Douglas, the afternoon programming and, and that. But let's see, Wednesday evening, um, uh, this Beretta episode's interesting because Susan Terrell is in it. <laughs> yes. Playing a dual role. Yeah, I, I, I remember that episode. I remember that. You know, Beretta turned out to be, you know, let's face it, like a, a murderer. An actual murderer, yeah. Yeah, and, and, a, and a really bad guy. But he was actually quite good. And I, th I, I, I haven't seen it, but I bet Beretta kind of holds up. Beretta had the best theme song. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Uh, what is it called? Keep your eye uh, um, on the sparrow. On the sparrow, yeah, yeah. That was a great theme song. I mean, Barney Miller was a great theme song, but also, um, I would say the best theme song probably was "Good Times" the Jeffersons. The Jefferson. Yeah. I like the the Beretta. Um, that sums up Wednesday, and then Thursday. Thursday is interesting because I probably would end up watching game five of this world series, which is in, which is in the listings here, if necessary, you know, I believe it was Boston Red Sox, Cincinnati Reds. So I probably wouldn't be watching that, but that said, if that wasn't the case, Barney Miller's on, then you got, uh, pillow yeah. talk is on with Doris Day and rock Hudson. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't watch that, but I'll tell you what I would have watched is Faye. Yeah, that gets reviewed in this in the very beginning of the issue, and I'd never heard of it, and it sounds really interesting. Well, it's Lee Grant, and I would have watched it because if I had read that review, especially because the review critic says it has two two really abysmal performances. And he doesn't mention who. Yep. So I would have watched it just to see it, just to see who he was talking about. <laughs> who does he hate in this? Yeah, who, who's so bad? But yeah, I, lo I love Lee Grant. I think Lee Grant was was a great actress, and and um, I, I don't I, I I don't remember that show. So I don't know if it went anywhere, but then um, Streets of San Francisco was a great show. Michael Douglas, Carl Malden, guy who did the ads. Don't leave home without it. He was the original host of Unsolved Mysteries before Robert Stack and Dennis Farina. No way. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't see that. I never saw that one. But there was something else on Thursday. There's um, a James Garner movie that looks pretty good. That looked really good. Actually, Maddox is on Thursday night. That's probably what I would watch because that was at the time my favorite show. I love that guy. <laughs> David Jansen, like Man Mannix. Who was in uh, Spencer for Hire. Was he? Yeah, he played, uh, you would never see this, but he played Spencer's boss. <laughs> I didn't know that. Because he was the fugitive as well, right, David Jansen? He was, yeah, he was yeah. the fugitive. Yeah. And, um, but Mike Douglas is also on the same time, so I might have watched that. Although he had um, Sally Struthers was his co host, David Nibbin, Neil Sadaka. <laughs> What a weird group. Yeah, like Merv Griffin that night as Mort Saul, Ben Vereen, <laughs> Marsha Wallace, and attorney Vincent Bulgasi. Just, just insane. Like that panel. That's a that's a panel right there. Yeah, and then but there was something interesting on channel 13 as well. Um can't I can't find it. Oh, Monty, now. Pi Monty Python's on. Oh, Monty Python's on channel 13. So I probably would I probably would try if I could, depending on what depending what the weather was like, I could get PBS. 
Or if we moved my brother and I moved the TV to a different part of the house. We yeah. could, we, yes. Were you like a tinfoil brother, like a little further, move over here. Yeah. Or you just bashed it. Yeah. Just hit, hit it. Hit it five times. <laughs> well, everyone had like a weird, a weird like coat. Be like, if you hit it on the side four times and then you slap the top, it always like some kind of weird code. I would always sit like in the front room of our house where the TV was. I would sit on the floor in front of the TV. And if the thing got started getting fuzzy, I, I, I would have to sense my father taking off his shoe or his slipper because he would whip it at the TV and I would whiz my head. I would definitely go, boom. <laughs> my father had an ability to get it just over the top of my head onto the top of this thing. And it would always work. He would have been great at cornhole. He was a natural. <laughs> he was a natural. But that, if, they had a, if there was ever a sport... Getting the TV to come in by throwing it 10 feet across the room with your slipper. Perfect picture. Next big show. That's going to be on ESPN. Monty Python, I, I got the opportunity. I actually got to interview John Cleese this year, which was crazy. It's fascinating to me that that show went to every single PBS station and they all turned it down. And the yeah. only one who agreed to air it was in Dallas, either Dallas or Houston, Texas. And that was the first one. And then the others picked it up, but it wasn't New York or LA or Boston. It was Texas. I used to get an upstate New York. We used to get Canadian also uh, on the odd moment or night or when the, all that, the, like the stars collided, we would get Clinton Canadian broadcasting CBC and Monty Python was on there too. There was a couple of shows. I don't remember what we would we, we would get, but my brother would call, "Hey, get in here!" And like, and would like you know, there'd be a Montreal Expos game on. Or, yeah, like that was just so exciting! Wow. Oh yeah, it was like magic. You're pulling in something from space. Be like, we got this. We took one family vacation and a, and a mis a misguided horrible idea on my mother's behalf. We all got in the car and drove to Niagara Falls, and. We like we brought food because we didn't have any money. So my mother packed a cooler of like you know ham sandwiches and hard candy. But I remember going to the motel we were staying in, and Kojak was on. But wait a minute, Kojak's not on this night. Yeah. Like, wait a minute, but it's it's Saturday. How can Kojak be on? It's on. <laughs> it's on a Tuesday. These people are living life up here. What are they doing? What are they doing to the world? This is not right. <laughs> not on now. We're not meant to be here. I get hit in the back of the head with my father's slipper. <laughs> Shut up. Right. We only came here for the reception. Final night of the week, Friday. What'd you do? Friday was a great night too because Sam for the Sun came on, which I loved. He was. I remember I had um, I had uh, a Red Fox album called uh, You Gotta Wash Your Ass. Gotta Wash Your Ass. <laughs> which is a great, great album. I only recently, when I sold my album collection, I only recently got rid of it, hesitantly got rid of that, but it was great. Red Fox was great. My favorite uh, Red Fox trivia, he was prison cellmates with Malcolm X. No shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was, that in the, was that in the Spike Lee movie? It might be in the Spike Lee movie, but they, they became friends because they both had red hair and in their respective neighborhoods, they were called Red and they were like <laughs> lifelong friends after that. That's great. That's that's amazing, but uh, yeah, I love I love that one, and uh, and then um, after that, um, Chico and the Man came on, and but I remember my my father loved Mash. If my father was going to watch TV, he loved Mash, but I loved Chico and the Man. I loved uh, Freddie Prince. He was so funny. Yeah. I love Jack Albertson. Jack Albertson was completely underrated on that show. He was great, and and uh, Scatman Crothers was on there. Tonight's episode, Penny Marshall guested that must have been interesting yeah uh, i remember Fre i loved seeing freddie Pr freddie prince did a really funny stand-up he was just talking about like his neighborhood his friends he was funny he was very unique and he was one of the first stand-ups to basically get his own show that was built around him it was yeah. he's kind of forgotten now and there's a funny story where he's the only guy that ever got andy kaufman to break character as Tony Clifton. <laughs> How do you do it? So Kaufman was there, performance Tony Clifton, and he's, you know, insulting everybody. And uh, Freddie Prince went up to him and got him by the throat and bent his arm behind his back because he said something to him. And Andy went like, oh, it's Andy, it's Andy. That's hysterical. <laughs> Only wow. time it happened, apparently. That's amazing. Well, he was great. He's, you know, the mustache. And, the, you oh, know, yeah. the, I got to meet his son, got to work with his son. His son uh, is a great, 
great guy too, Freddie Prince Jr. And uh, and then you know I guess uh, I probably would watch Rockford Files because that's another you know kind of iconic detective at that time. That guy was swinging and cool. And oh yeah, that holds up. Does not feel dated to me. That doesn't feel dated. No, I'm from uh, I haven't seen it in a while, but last time I saw it was all, and that that a great theme song. I met, I did I did have an opportunity to meet James Garner, and he was a complete asshole. And he was a dick. So it kind of. That's yeah. keeping in character with the kind of roles he would play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I always thought he was kind of a cool guy. You know, I drove a cool car and yeah. always hung out in his car, but yeah. You've, have you found that for the most part, I've found at least that surprisingly, like, most people are actually pretty nice and down to earth and blue collar. And it's sort of an exception that someone's like kind of a dick. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, there's a few, few actors that I've, you know, my actors, right? Yeah. 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 I've worked with a few that have been complete assholes. John Boyd, biggest prick I've well, ever met. Yeah. That guy. Um, and, uh, but other than that, you know, everybody's been, I mean, I mean, actors, I'm sure there are, there are people out there that say, Oh, that guy, Frank, well, oh, yeah, I met him. He's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, for the most part, everybody got it. Yeah, everybody. You know, actors are tough. They're tough to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I never had any. I never had any major issues other than you know, other than my experience working with Voight. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what were you with Voight? I was in. I was in season. I forget what season. Oh six. yes, of um. Uh, Redone. Redone. Yeah. 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 And um, that was really fun. That was really fun. Really good writing. And um, I, I worked a lot with John Boyd, unfortunately. <laughs> he actually, he actually, the, the one, the, one of the highlights of that was during the scene. I told the story before, but um, we rehearsed the scene a couple of times. There's he and I like having having a conversation in a, in a, in a men's room, and um, we, I kind of confront him. I get at the end of the scene, I confront him and say, "Now you listen to me." And and um, we rehearsed it a couple of times. You know, John Dahl was directing the episode. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the whole crew is kind of huddled in the corner of this small, um, it wasn't an actual uh, restroom, it was a set to, to resemble, but it was very small. And out of nowhere, uh, on, on the first take, John Voigt, when I get in close to confront him, rears back, slaps me across the face. What? With all his force. And John Voigt is a big guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a big person. He's like, you know, like, He's this much taller than me, and he's much bigger, heavier than I am. <clears throat> and I went flying back like six feet. Yeah. And um, the director said, "Cut." And I, I said, "Why? Why? Why? Why did you do that? I, I, I mean, somebody give me a script. I don't see that. In, I didn't see that in the script." Yeah. Big hand mark on my face, and uh, all he said was, "No, oh, I didn't hit you that hard." And I said, well, "But why did you do it?" Without telling me, right? Because rule number one, you don't do you. That's verbatim, for, verbatim, for, 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 yeah. for, 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 um, it's forbidden, and you just don't, you don't, you know, you, unless it's precisely mapped out. There's no physical contact. Yeah. So yeah, but that you know, he was always talking. Yeah, I bet that uh, it doesn't surprise me given who he he hangs out with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Is there anything you're watching now to wrap up? Is there any like comfort shows or anything you're watching in lockdown? Well, I've been watching to, up to the second Terrace House. Are you familiar with that show? No. Oh, it's a it's a, it's a Japanese reality show. Okay. And um and it's all it's, it's like it's like it's called Terrace House, and it's just these four uh, six people, it's three men and three women who are put in this house. It's, it's I can't describe it. Other than it's like it's Big Brother. Fascinating, yeah. But it's like none of that bullshit. It's like every every like tedious moment. You know, all in subtitles. So it's like an Andy Warhol reality show. It's really interesting. I'm watching that. I'm watching, um, my wife and I love to watch. We, we watched every season, every episode of this show called Alone, which is for a million dollar cash prize, 10 contestants, like in the Arctic, alone. Each of them on one, like on a separate island, trying to survive the wild. So like that kind of stuff. I yeah. Watch. And I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't watch a lot of scripted. I, I, I watch a lot of escapism. I watch, I watch Rachel Maddow and then I watch like, you know, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. I hear that so much from actors or people that work in the industry. Cause if you're trying to watch a scripted thing, you spend the whole time be like, ah, no, nah, you shouldn't have done that. Or like, you can't, you can't unplug. You can't not be at work in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, I, I do. All I'm thinking is how this is too much like the idea that I'm writing. Damn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've thrown scripts in the, in the trash that I had finished when like a new episode of a show comes on and I'm like, God damn it. I, I, I had the same experience. I like, I, I wrote, I finished, I wrote a whole script about a, about a disgraced politician, a guy who like does, he, he, he gets caught on tape doing something really lewd. And he's like, he's like a, um, like a, a, a an aw shucks, you know, like real Andy Griffith <laughs> kind of face in the crowd kind of guy. Yeah, and he gets caught doing something really bad, and it's called canceled. And he has to join a, a canceled support group. And then I'm like, I'm just, just flipping through like the the trades. Oh, Nikki Glaser has a show called what's it called? Canceled. <laughs> threw my phone in the toilet, and then I threw my computer out the window, and then I sat in the corner and cried. Yeah, yeah. No, I've 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 been right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing original. Nothing original. In there. Yeah, it's just like who gets there first. A lot of times, I think. Uh, yeah. That's it. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's been great talking to you. It's been fun, man. Hope I, I took up too much time. No, not at all. We're all in lockdown. People people want to hear the content. We're going to be editing this for six weeks. There you go. That is Frank. It did not take me six weeks to edit this episode. It only took four. I'm kidding. It it took a couple hours, like all episodes. It was not more edit intensive than any other episodes. And also, and this is just a personal message from me. This has nothing to do with Frank. Uh, I, I take full responsibility for this message. John Voigt, if I ever meet you, I will kick your dentures through the back of your skull. You enormous piece of garbage uh but you know he's an old man he'll probably die soon anyway uh and i apologize for that incredibly negative sentiment but come on man everyone should want to punch john voigt right right is there anyone who doesn't want to punch john voigt slapping frank among other things anyway uh i don't want to i don't want to get too negative here uh the lockdowns made some people violent it, it's happened uh if you want to email me about who you'd like to punch maybe it's me i don't know you can email me at tv guidance counselor gmail.com or can at i can read.com at kenneth w reed reid on all the social media and at tv guidance on those as well uh you can also just message me uh let me know if you have guest requests i'm trying to get all the guests you guys have requested hopefully i've gotten some that you have requested and that you wanted and you've enjoyed the episodes and i have more to come uh just let me know how you're doing let me know what you're watching in the continued lockdown in the lost year of 2020 and i'll see you again next week for a brand new episode of tv guidance counselor i'm not frank gorshin